Good evening and welcome to Safe Guidance TV. My name is Ray Douglas and today we have a special guest, Dr. Martin Glynn. For some people, Dr. Glynn doesn't need any interrupt. In into, you know, anything. <laughs> he doesn't need, you know, this is Dr. Martin Glynn, because um, I think that would be taken away from from his title because, um, you know, what do they call a person, Dr. Glynn, who can speak many languages? It's a polyglot, right? Yeah. Something like that. So uh, what's the word for an ac academic who does more than just lecture? Um, knowledge nerd. Knowledge nerd. <laughs> Um, no, the, the reason I say that is because um, I don't mind when people call me a nerd because they normally associate people who are nerdy with reading. Mm. And and I know it sounds strange, but at a time when reading is not fashionable and investigation, it's quite old fashioned. <clears throat> and so I look at certain terms that we give to people. So from my point of view, I am... I'm the original nerdster when it comes to knowledge. It's just that I'm fortunate that I've managed to make a life, and I'm not going to say a career because this has been my life, out of books and reading and writing. Yeah. Um, and in some respects, you know, I I believe that everybody that I come into contact with, even whether it's prison, on the road, everybody yeah. has a story to tell. I feel blessed that I was supported in my life to to make it part of my life. So I would say, in essence, I'm a so, storyteller. Okay. So, so this is the thing about the story. So you know, you're, 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 I'm sure you're you know you're one of the first people I sp heard speak about the GRIOP tradition. And for those who are um, tuning in today, in a nutshell, give us what the GRIOP tradition is, because I see you as a as a as as a, as a GRIOP of sorts in a village of 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 people and we don't just say on oh, you know dr glenn what do you think about this you bring a lot of things to the space especially around social justice yeah well the the thing about the grio i mean historically in africa is, is the custodian and the guardian of the history of that community that village um it's a word that's kind of used i think you know during black history month and you know those things come along um within a western european sense they'll say social historian Whereas I believe that the custodian of the past is told through stories, it's told through readings. So there's a, there's a, there's a real important function. If we look within our community right now, we've got hip-hop, trap, drill, grime, and they tell a story of a certain aspect of the lived reality. But there's much, 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 much more that is not told. So, so in some respects, uh, the elder who talks about their, their village in the Caribbean. Uh, the nurse who's been retired from the NHS and she was served 50 odd years. Yeah. You know, when we put that together, it makes the narrative. And what's happened is, is, is because it's predominantly oral, um, the oral narrative. So if you go to a dumpling shop or a barber shop or a nail salon, you will see the kind of really pure form of how those stories are passed on. But within our society that requires science and technology, we have to make some sense out of it to not just pass on the knowledge and share the stories, but to see where those stories can change the society in which we live. And there's, there's the key point. So let's go, let's start at the very beginning because you're unique, unique in many ways, but also as a, as a mixed race individual myself, there are very few mixed race elders, if that makes sense. Um, I'm seen as that kind of generation, the, you know, the Afro at the pram in the 70s, <laughs> you know, the, the Thatcher's Britain. Um, but you're essentially one generation above me. So let's start at the very beginning, because that's not a Brummie accent, is it? Let's be honest. No, I'm from Nottingham and uh, I've, I've got a baby book. My mom kept a baby book. So the first, three years of my life i lived in six homes this was in night i was born in 1957 so between 1957 and 1960 i we were constantly on the move every three four months um i'm one of the first generation who was exposed to no dogs no irish no coloreds and the relevance of it is my mom as a white woman um when we had nowhere to live would put me behind a wall and it would there be notices outside the house that would say uh, ch women and children welcome 
So my mum would knock the door and they'd see this white woman standing there and they'd say, look, you know, and she'd say, oh, I've got a child. And they'd bring me out and then we wouldn't have a place to live. And so, and, and then the other thing is, when I was about seven, we lived in a place called St. Anne's in Nottingham, which was one of the last modern day slums, back-to-back -back housing, outside toilets. And I remember we used to go to communal baths. We never had a bathroom. We never had inside toilet. And I remember my first experience of being called names is when I went to school, I thought that everybody went to public baths. What I suddenly realized is, is that public baths were for poor people, public baths were mm -hmm. for people that were relegated. I never knew any difference. So as young as six, living in a back-to-back -back house, um, living in a, a, a slum, what people now call ghetto, but to tell you the truth, we actually grew up in a slum where there was cobbled streets, back-to-back -back housing. It it was not nice. That's all we knew. Mm -hmm. So my first in, in, entry into poverty was growing up in a slum. And between 6 and 11, um, when my mom met my stepfather, um, I didn't realize at the time she was his housekeeper. And at the time, this is a white guy that took on two children, me and my sister. And that was really the entry point where my consciousness around my difference kicked in. I remember probably about seven or eight, um, long time before social services, that we were standing on a table with the justice of the peace, me and my sister. And it was almost like they read a statement out, like a marriage statement. And then suddenly we were adopted. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, there was no, there was no uh, investigation. There was no risk assessment. There was nothing. It was just me and my sister on this table with my mom. And, you know, my stepfather, who'd fought in the Second World War um, in Italy against Mussolini, I found out later that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, but he was very much a person of his time. He was brutal, he was tough, and he was hard. And basically, my mama, my mom had the ultimatum to basically to marry my my stepfather or we'd have nowhere to live and and in some respects that was that journey and my early consciousness because my father was such a he was a tough hard man that had been through the second world war i we weren't his children and at the time when you were the stepchildren and you came from a, a mixed background like me i mean for a white guy and a white woman to have me, you know, like I was the, a bit like the only black face in that family. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the things that I was exposed to, and it was only when I got to about my teenage years that I thought that everybody went through verbal abuse and racism. And I, but I, I just remember growing up that what I couldn't understand is. Nowadays, you'd call it racism, but white people are just abusive. I mean, you know, that the way that they define my mother for going sleeping with a Jamaican. Mm -hmm. And then when I encountered black people for the first time having light skin, yeah. and I was 11. And, I, and so I remember in 1968, I watched the, 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 my earliest recollection of black politics was I actually watched the 1968 Olympics with the Black Power salute. Okay. And I didn't have a clue really what it was about. I just knew when I watched it, it meant something. You know, I, I remember the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968 because the Olympics was the same year. I remember when Winston Churchill was buried and I remember when Malcolm X was murdered. And those are things that I remembered as a child. Yeah. Uh, I remember the first time I saw Pelly play football. I remember the first time I saw Gary Sobers play cricket. So I was, although I was in a predominantly white household, Virtually everything I was exposed to that meant something was like me. Well, you, you, you know what's interesting? Because um, obviously the title of today's show is Diversity or Diverse City. Very much the, the mixed race experience is you might go to one side of your family to an event and it's John Holt and it's Ken Booth and it's Corey Gop, Rice and Peas and, you know, and then you go to another family event and the, the, the kind of white English side of your family and it's, Shawadi Wadi and, you know, tuna sandwiches. And you've got a, an uncle who's saying, I'm not racist, but but you're the only brown face in the whole party. So 
the double conscience, and this is something that you've spoken about for many years, the double conscience around being a mixed race person those years is interesting to hear, hear, hear what you say. And when we look now, and the mixed race children are no longer solely Caribbean or white Irish or Caribbean white English, it's, you'll have a, you know, um, a, a West African who'll have a child with a, with a Romanian or a what, Eastern European. Is it interesting? What, what I, think, I, think, I think that um, when, I was, when I was growing up, um, I think my first awareness of girls was about 14, 15, proper awareness. And um, at school, I just, I like girls. And my mom pulled me to one side one day and she goes, I'm not going to let you go out with a white girl. And I, I was like, I said, mom, you know what I mean? You're white. But she yeah. said to me that in 1955, when she met my father, the abuse that she took. So she said, it's not that um, she didn't want me to have a mixed relationship. My mom, somehow naive as she was, understood the social convention that restricted the mixing of the races. So I didn't grow up in that environment where there was like a blended family on both sides. I grew up in a predominantly white family on a street predominantly with white kids with a school where, which was predominantly the kids that I met looked like me. So I'd be with them at school during the day and at night I'd go home. But I grew up at a time where the stigma of my mother leaving Wales to me to Jamaican meant that the whole family cut her off. So I was mm. never introduced to that side of the family. I mean, even to this day. And then when I went to Jamaica 30 odd years later, the biggest surprise to me was I saw a picture of me and my mother when I was born and she was holding me in my grandfather's shack. And I said, mm. to, I said to my grandfather, you know, I mean, my mom and dad, they never had a real relationship. And he goes, he just said, that's not true. He said, your father disappeared, but he never forgot about you. But because of the times, he disappeared. Mm. And it was only when I met him 30 odd years later, I asked him what happened. And then he talked to me about the 1958 race riots. And, and when my father told me that and, and the, the bits that my mom told me, it crystallized a lot of the confusion I had around community because growing up i didn't know where i fitted in at school i was very clever i liked shakespeare and charles dickens but i also hungered to speak my father's voice i hungered to listen to that what i now know as the blue spot gram i i hungered to eat caribbean food mm -hmm. and those never things were never really crystallized because if you were a child of the 50s you were exposed exposed to the level of hostility and racism that by the time it got into the 60s yeah. started to become more blended and so, so, let me, as, so let me ask you something there which is really important because what i want to why why i've asked for you to go back is because when we look at the overarching strategies if you will around diversity and community cohesion had we reached the concept of assimilation then those years was that assimilation period or was that we haven't entered into multiculturalism right no, we never, I mean, back in those days, and, and it's funny because I can say back in the day, um, when I was growing up, um, the N-word, that was normal. I mean, my stepfather would call me that. He would call me, you know, I was speaking to someone today about all the words that you can call a white person of abuse. There's very few, unless you use the prefix white. Whereas I was exposed in the house and outside the house to every racial slur to a point where when I first met black people fully for the first time and I thought the words I was being called, that's what it, that's what it was. So I would use those words. I didn't realize that they were terms of abuse at the time because they were so normal. They were absolutely so normal. It reminds me when I'm working in prison and prisoners use the N-word. It's like it's just a cultural norm. Yeah, when I was growing up, it was like that. But what happened is it's that, that you used to grow up and sticks and stones may break my bones, calling never hurts me. But when I was growing up and I reached about seven, the word followed physical abuse. So somebody would say, you, this, bam. So I discovered mm -hmm. that when somebody else would get called a name like four eyes, if they had glasses, they wouldn't get hit. 
I would get hit following this word. So I then very, very early on knew the association that when certain words were said, certain actions were going to be taken. And, 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 on, and on that basis, when I got to school, I then started to feel the full weight of, I, I know this might sound strange, but it'll kind of highlight to you about um, the idea of assimilation. We would have, when I was in year seven, there was, uh, we used to have gym. And so it meant that all the years were together. Yeah. I was I was in a grammar stream at school until we had games and then we had everybody together. So it was like in my school, it was Italian. It was at the time it wasn't there weren't on faith. It was Pakistani, Italian, Jamaican. And um, I was never into fighting. I was too skinny. So I, I couldn't take I didn't like fighting. I used to get hit. So I was frightened of getting hit. And it was one particular moment when it was that moment you get at school when I heard a couple of guys say, right, break time. Wait till break time. Mm. So anyway, we come out and I come out. Don't ask me what I was going to do. I wasn't Superman, but I thought, yeah, I'm going to get involved in a fight for the first time. And then I come outside and black guys on one side, white guys on the other. And I'm looking, I said, what side do I take? Anyway, they, they, before they had a fight, they came to me and they just said, look, Martin, you know, we're going to beat, we're going to beat each other up, but you can't get involved. I said, what do you mean? I said, these are my friends. And they were mainly the black, black people. And the black people said, look, Martin, no disrespect. Yeah, but you can't. Mm -hmm. I said, hold on a minute. You're my friends. They said, yeah, but this is a fight between us and them. And you're a part of us and them. You're, you're struggling. So, so they, they, they said to me I couldn't fight. That followed me for years. Mm -hmm. And I ended up writing a poem about it because I remember when England used to play the West Indies and um, people, I, I idolized the West Indies. I knew a lot of the West Indies team from the 60s. I was a mascot for the West Indies cricket team. I absolutely idolized Brazil, okay. Pele, Muhammad Ali. And um, but I remember when it, when I was about thirteen, and I used to go to Trent Bridge to watch cricket, and I'd meet fathers, right? White fathers would say, "Listen, yeah, when when England was beating the West Indies, they'd come up and say, you know, someone we're beating your lot.' But the moment the other reverse happened, when West Indies were beating England, they'd remind me and say, "Remember, you are for one of us." Yeah. And I always remember elders, you know, elders at the time, Jamaican elders would say to me, and they'd mime, they say, son, you can't understand what I'm saying. And they would start to speak to me in a way because they're your mother's white and I know you can't understand me. So suddenly what I realized from I was about 13, 14 is that if I'm going to have any sense of community, and I had to find that. I had to be able to leverage everything that I had to gain access because in my formative years, I was made to feel rootless. Um, I was never, like if there was a party on the street, I would never get the invite. And I'd say to mom, why not? And she'd say, oh, they probably don't like you. And I said, well, everybody else is going in there. But black people, on the other hand, would do the same thing. So what I had to do is to then my consciousness my cultural and political consciousness, I would say, started from about 13. When, in 1968, when I was 11, 12, and I saw Afro, I had one. And I didn't have an Afro just because it looked good. I had it because it meant something. It infuriated my stepfather. And my stepfather hated me having an Afro because he equated it with black power. So let me, let me, let me, um, let me ask you something, because it's the decade that I was born in. For you as a teenager then, in the 70s yeah so you're 17 left school you're in the 70s what was it like because what i'm trying to capture here is where we are now we have to, where we are now as in the last three months around the whole concept of racial justice we have to go back to 1960s nottingham 1970s birmingham 1980s brixton 90, 
you know, we have to go on this journey. So, being well, I would young, say 17, 17, um, by 17, I was a father. Um, my daughter was uh, six months old. Um, we had reggae music. I discovered reggae music. I mean, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about I discovered sound system because sound system, blues parties. Um, in the 70s, we had what's called Sticksman. Black Slate was a reggae group. Sticksman, they used to wear a piece of bamboo in the back pocket of a bad man. Um, it was a very dark, murky world. And then in 1976, three things happened. Dread Beat and Blood, Linton, Quasi Johnson, which spoke to me. That's when my poetry started. Aswad with Back to Africa and Steel Pulse with Tree Babylon. Um, so oh, let, me ask, let me ask something, because this is key. So because me and someone was having a conversation about this yesterday. The, the standoff between the Windrush and the first generation children who were saying, actually, this is not where we belong. And we're looking to Africa and we're not, you know, and we're, ras we're turning RAS and, on the, you know, talking about Garvey and talking about, you know, repatriation and reparations. Then what was that like between the older community and this first generation? Well, let me put it in the context of Teddy Boys. When people came back from the Second World War, working class white kids kind of they they created rock and roll. They were they were distancing themselves from their parents who were more conservative. They'd just come back from the war. Well, in the same way, when you were 17, um elders were um working hard, they were going to church, they were establishing churches, they they were they were hard workers. They weren't because the way that they worked and the shift patterns they had, they were very clear. And they said, You must listen to the white man. You must listen to your teacher. You because their their argument was you're living in a white person's country and you need to be compliant because if you're not, this is what's gonna happen. So we were saying, nah, you Listen, yeah, skinheads didn't chase you. We very, very, because we were living two parallel worlds. The world of our yeah. parents. The world of yeah. our parents was the living room you couldn't go into, that nobody went into. The living room, yeah. um, the churches where we never got access to. You know, so and, it was... A, that's, that's an interesting point when you say that, because I, I remember my, my first experience of church was going into the church hall next to the main church after the service and the congregation were Afro-Caribbean. We weren't in the main church. Is that your experience? Yeah, but I, I always remember, I used to go to Sunday school as a child uh, when I was young. And when I discovered black churches, I never understood why they were called black churches. I never understood that, why is there only black people in here? I, I never understood that. Mm. And then what I realized is, is that we were trying to establish a sense of identity according to where we were at, the way that our elders did. But the moment sound system came along, uh, what started to happen is that you were then introduced, this was a long time before uh, two-tone music. This was yeah. the day when suddenly um, people would twist up their hair and for the first time when you were 17, you encountered Rasta. You encountered red, green, and gold. You encountered nationalism. You encountered what you start to encounter is people that were reading about Marcus Garvey. Yeah. It, when I was 17, I used to work in a factory. And I was around people who said, Why am I to me? I've got Africa. The vernacular changed. You know, most of us up to 17, we spoke with our regional accents. And then Linton Quasi Johnson. Steel Pulse, Aswad came along and through reggae music suddenly said, you know something, language is power. So when we used reggae music and when we listened to dub poetry and we went to the theatre, and I'm not talking about the theatre the way it is, when we created theatre, yeah. what suddenly started to happen is, is it was like a confused consciousness because we just knew white people didn't like us. The police were aggressive. So we kind of grew up with that. But what happened is our elders would say, listen, you must read the Bible. So when Rasta came along, 
Rasta said, you must read the Bible, but you have to understand all the white man go on by reading the Bible. So Rasta would hold reasoning sessions. And all the stuff that was being talked about in the Bible yeah. was being applied to our lived reality. So, for instance, when I, the first time I ever heard a Rasta man say, I and I. And I said, well, why don't you say we? And he, said, and he talked about just the, the language of Rasta, I and I. You know, so suddenly the music, the language, the vernacular was giving us tools aesthetically to cope. Like when we'd walk out in red, green and gold, yeah. um, the trousers, the clothes, the fashion, the music. There was a sense this is ours. And then on top of that, this was this is the this is where the diversity comes in because on Saturday nights we would like we'd go to a club that would finish about eleven, but the other clubs and the blues wouldn't start till half past one, two o'clock in the morning. So we then had to fill that gap. So we discovered late night pictures. So mm. suddenly Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee became, and kung fu movies. The first kung fu movie I ever seen was it, it was amazing because. We honestly felt after we'd seen Enter the Dragon and all of the Japanese Kung Fu movies, we felt we were like a paramilitary force. When we'd walk, we, we never went to Kung Fu. We never did no training. We just watched movies. So when, when, when you get into the city center, you honestly felt like that. So suddenly we identified with Kung Fu, fitness. Rasta was vegetarian food. Reggae music was conscious lyrics. Yeah. So out of that, the elders above us, and I'm not talking about church elders. Church elders were very good at morals and values and <laughs> beliefs. But what happened is, in the midst of when we got from seven, when we had the first riot in Notting Hill, that riot in '76, suddenly things like mangrove, things like in '76, reading became important. So it was no longer where you just jumping up and down to Augustus Pablo and listening to Shaka and V Rocket and Mafia and Cox and wasn't just about that. You then started to read and you was introduced to Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. And I remember, I'm not, you know, it's ironic me becoming, you know, getting a doctorate, but in, in, in this, you know, between 17 and 25, we had the minor strike, we had all of this kind of stuff. And we used to hate students. We used to hate students because what we realize is, is that we felt, why are you lying there? Why is it we're patrolling up and on the streets? Why is it we're, we're arguing about this? Why is it we're playing reggae music and we never see you? Mm. We never, we, back in those days, we, because we, we saw the value of reading and writing, but we didn't put yeah. value on so, the so value of education as a tool for liberation at that time. Okay, interesting, because obviously we're talking about an era where kind of, Access to university was free, etc. But so, and and, and just to, for those who've just tuned in, I, something dawned upon me recently because a lot of people just see the last three months. But when you speak to the elders and in your generation, and we talk about the timeline of how we got here, you know, people will always remember 2020. But we have to understand the journey, and we even with the conversations now about, you know, um, last night at the proms and certain songs, et cetera. But people have to understand the journey. So what you're talking about now, you're going on, you're in the 80s, so where we're at now. So my understanding, so it was assimilation. Then we went across to multiculturalism, right? So now multiculturalism, because you have these riots up and down the country, in London, in Bristol, in Liverpool, in Birmingham, right? In Nottingham, all over, you know, there's this, 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 this thing about keep boiling over because of people pushing back against racism, because of lack of opportunity. So the 80s for you now. So you're, 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 a, you're a young man in the 80s. Um, had you started on your academic journey then? What, where, where were you at? No, I didn't start my academic journey then. I mean, we'd been through the 1970s. I was in Notting Hill in 1976. I was in Brixton in 1981. Um, in 1985, I left my home city. I trained to be a teacher in 1984, secondary school teacher. I said, I, I want to be where the worst kids are. And I ended up in Kennington at a school called Lillian Bailey's. Oh, yeah, and in 1984, I was a design and technology teacher. And to tell you what it was like in the 80s, 
I was a design technology teacher, and the first class I ever got, there was two fights. And the first question that a student said to me is, is like, yo, Martin, you know the the uh, the guillotine? It was chained up, right? Thick chain. Man said, yo, I need the key for the guillotine. Why? I want to cut my man's fingers off. Um, Sir, can I make a kung fu? I was a design technology teacher. Sir, yeah. can I make a kung fu star? Why do you want to make a kung fu star? We, we, we're using plastic. Now, I want to use metal ready because there's a, there's a man in the first year I don't like. Now, yeah. in the 1985 riots in Brixton, a lot of my kids were in it. Okay. And that was the first time when I saw my kids, my students getting brutalized by the police, really brutalized. And so as a teacher, I remember in 1985, we had the riots. There was a Black People's Day of Action. We had CND. We had anti-apartheid. And the riots happened. Oh, Cherry Gross. Yeah, all at the same time, Cherry Gross. Okay. And then Cherry yeah. Gross happened. Then we had the Tottenham Uprisings. And then we had the Brixton Uprisings. And um, there was a Black People's Day of Action in 1985. And at the time, I had risen to the ranks as a poet. And I'd been performing as a poet. So I was very well known as a poet. But I was a design and technology teacher in South London. And um, at the time, I worked for the ILEA, the Inner London Education Authority. And the ILEA had a policy that if you were affiliated to a political movement, you could actually take time off school. So people with CND were going to rally. People who were involved in other campaigns. Anyway, the 1985 riots comes along. And my students were getting brutalized. And I was asked to be a steward, one of the lead stewards on the Black People's Day of Action. So I went to my head of department and I said, um, you know, I need to take the day off for this day of action. I need cover. And he goes, you can't. And I said, what? He says, you can't. <laughs> anyway, I, I just walked out of school. I okay. remember just walking out of school. Anyway, we went on the march. We went to Hyde Park. And at the time, I was the, one of the lead stewards. So there was about 10,000 black people in Hyde Park. And if you've ever been to Hyde Park, it's, it's pretty big. But there was 10,000 black people. We'd march from Brixton to, to Hyde Park. It was very cold. And I never, I never forget that. But I remember there were two trucks come in. And it was the Broadwater Farm Collective. And they came in with balaclavas and... There was on these two trucks and the police had surrounded Hyde Park and they said, um, Martin, it looks like they're going to kick off. You need to use your poetry to call people to action. So I had two megaphones and I had gloves on at the time and I had to use my poetry with the broad. I was on the truck using my poetry to calm the community down to not rebel against the police. The moment. I did that. Um, in 1985, my first book came out called The Ratchet Attack. And suddenly, overnight, my work and me, um, I ended up performing with The Last Poets, performing at the Africa Center. Within 1985, um, there was three schools of poetry in the black community. We had Linton Kwesi Johnson, which was dub poetry, but was very class centered. We had Benjamin Zephaniah, which was more of a humanist. And Benjamin was into world politics. And we were Pan-Africanists. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, our, my argument was at the time, I can't join with working class white people if you're racist. And I can't be a humanist when my humanity. So within poetry, a bit like hip hop, there were various schools. But what happened is, is my work as an activist, educator, performer, playwright, all of it intersected. And it kind of gave birth to what you see now. But what happened in 1985, and if you look at the music at the time, we were the CNN at the time. You know, yeah. I always say to people that we were doing what we were doing before hip hop. When the Sugar Hill Gang came out with Rapper's Delight, that actually killed off a lot of poetry at the time because what happened is when hip hop came along with Rapper's Delight, that was one of the first tunes. It said you could dance to hip hop. Yeah. Remember, we had Lovers Rock, we had we had house parties, but dub poetry was a call to arms. It was people, 
look at what's going on. Mm. And then what happened is very, very skillfully, we had uh, David Rodigan was firing on all four cylinders. Tim Westwood was round about the time. So suddenly white people were playing our music. So when yeah. you look at the carnival at the time and look at what happened in carnival, it didn't, you know, when carnival first started out and then suddenly it became more culturally diverse. And so, so what happened in, the, in, in, in at that particular juncture, I would, I mean, I can't prove it categorically, but I would say that rock against racism, two-tone music, suddenly there was an intersection where the white left, because I remember when we'd go on a march, the white left would always turn up, always, always turn up. And it got to a point where we were so sick of it, they had to stand, they had to get to the back. At first, they used to lead on a lot of these marches because the white left would do the march. We would follow that march. But when in 1985, why, why, why was that embraced? So again, sorry. Why, 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 why was why did you feel that that was disingenuous? Well, because because in 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 the in the 70s, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, most of the Caribbean elders that came along that were involved in politics, like people like Eric Huntley and the, the bookshops that set up understood class politics but with a race connective so they had the um race and class um i mean dark as how yeah you know that there, there were some heavyweight caribbean thinkers john the rose um eric huntley you know new beacon bookshops but we didn't feel that because the caribbean people that came before us came with a weight of a Caribbean literary tradition, Caribbean academic tradition. And they forged that into setting up bookshops and they set up um, spaces, whereas we were very young. So we, we, didn't, we couldn't relate to that. Okay. But what we learned later on in the 80s is that people like CLR James, Linton, Darkus Howe, African Dawn, I mean, the, the string of people that went before us laid the foundation for politics that, the, you know, those people clearly understood capitalism. They clearly understood the politics of the day. We just understood we were black and we were getting crap from the police and education. We responded to that. But mm. the people that were there before us that established the politics that we had understood class politics with a race dimension. And so the white left in some respects, was, and, you know, people, this is about the history that we're talking about here. Oh. The white left, it's not like it is now. The white left identified massively with black people's struggle. The, I'd also say that there was a history from the 1960s of black Marxists. Paul Robeson, I mean, as a classic example, was associated with Marxist. So what I'm dealing with, Marxism was a class-based philosophy. And so you find that for a lot of black people between in the 60s, right up to the mid 80s, they embraced the philosophy of Marxism, African Marxism, African socialism. But we, we weren't at that awareness, you understand? We just knew that white people didn't like us. Whereas what they tried to get us to understand is that actually it's a bit bigger than that. So, and so, so, there's something you said because you mentioned about performing at the African Centre. Africa Centre, yeah. Yeah. So, but what was interesting about that time, where we look at it in terms of the because this this kind of let's let, the strategy around multiculturalism. So you'd have the African Centre, but then you'd have the South Asian Pakistani Centre, you'd have the Irish Centre, you'd have the Polish Centre. So there were these spaces where they where you could be African Caribbean or you could be Irish and you could be Polish, and you could be Pakistan, but there was no interculturalism, right? So it was about, you'd get on with your neighbours, and whoever you lived with, you lived with, but I think the, the, the point I'm trying to get at is, where did you see the intersectionality of cohesion? Because I did, I did, I mean, I'd say in the mid-80s, I didn't see it. Where you saw it is when there was a national issue. I remember the miners' strike. I, I clear it very clearly. Met, I was I was on a writer's course, and there was a guy called Barry Heath from Nottingham, and um, we became great friends because we're from Nottingham. But he was a miner, mm. and when we first met, I was um, there was about two black people on the on the course, and um, you can appreciate 
it was a writer's course. So everything I had was about black people, revolution, Che Guevara, in in a room full of people that wrote Mills and Boone. Yeah. Barry, though, Barry was a working class miner who wrote theatre. And we became very close. And so one day, during the miners' strike, he goes, look, I'm judging a miners' poetry competition. Do you want to come to Mansfield? Now, if you know anything about Mansfield, it's like, yo, Bridget, that's like going to yeah. South Boston. I mean, this is tough white people. who, I mean, why are you taking me? He says, look, come. And I remember going into the, this miners' welfare club. And this guy is about 70 come up. And he just looked at me and he goes, uh, are you a miner? So I, I looked at Barry and I said, no. And he goes, it's all right, you can come in because you're black. So I'm like, I, I got, sh like, what do you mean? Because I'm black. He goes, listen, yeah, your people have been through stuff, so have we. But this is our place. So you walked in there as the only black person, and people are talking about Thatcher. They're talking about um, families being shut down, like Rover. I'm sure people at Rover would have done yeah. the same thing. They were talking about Thatcher. They were talking about preserving jobs. They were talking about Arthur Scargill. And suddenly, out of this, they said, look, Martin, there's going to be a new march for jobs. Um, and I remember they said, look, do you, want to, do you want to come to it? Now, that time, I'd never really engaged with a kind of working class struggle around employment, poverty. And I was invited to Bedford to perform poetry in this, this huge arena, this, this march. And I turned in there and... You had different types of left-wing people. You had miners. Yeah, anybody that's associated with poverty, working-class politics. And suddenly, for the first time, I'm being challenged by people who, who, white people, who actually understood Africa, who understood the Caribbean, who understood the Luddites, who understood the Chartist movement. Who, you know, And I'm like, oh, my God, what is going on here? So where you would see the intersection is where the politics force that intersection. Whereas when it would come to like reggae dance or if a white guy come in, he, he's either got to know every black person in the place. Yep. But the, the, where the intersection was, was not in popular culture. I can tell you, any black guy used to go to a wine bar, you know that he's checking a white girl. That was that was what it was. There was mm. You would never go to a wine bar and be talking about um, urban politics or Malcolm X. No, no. But at the time, with the minor strike, education, there were so many things going on. So what do you say then? Because this is a quite, this is a thing that I've quoted. When someone says, pulls you to the side and they'll say, you know, it's actually not about race, it's about class. Well, I, 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 I look at it this way. Is that race and class, like gender, are socially constructed. So therefore, it depends where, you're, where you position yourself in and who you are. Class is very important, but it depends on the class of people you're talking about and how you define it. They operate, for instance, one of the interesting things about contemporary understandings of race and class is that white people historically identify themselves purely with class. Now we're in an area of whiteness. So there's a clear understanding that white people are different. There's different types of white people who are tied to their class position, but they're also tied around a racialization of white identity. A racist who is overtly racist is not the same as a left-wing politician who is fighting for recognition around food banks. So within the construct of whiteness, but back in the day, the class was very, very clearly the, the vestiges from the post-industrial revolution to Queen Victoria, where class was very clear three distinct classes the upper classes which was the aristocracy the middle classes which fed off the aristocracy and the working classes back in the 40s and 50s sociology wasn't that sophisticated people like du bois in the 1920s had worked out that poor black people committed more crime that's because they were poor so there were scholars at the time that we were introduced to that were analyzing the class position within race as far back as the 20s and the, the late 1800s. Slavery, if you look at slavery, slavery creates a division of labor among slaves. There were house slaves and field slaves. Yeah. What do we say now? If, if, you, if you are a consultant and you don't have much to do with black people, they call you an Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom comes from slavery. 
all Uncle Tom was, he had more privileges than another black person did. The same way that working class white people and working class middle people, uh, middle class people have more privileges. And therefore, if it's based on privilege, that yeah. there are some. So if we now we use intersectionality, so I would say that it's all socially constructed to create division. So, so you're you're one of the few kind of Welsh, Caribbean mixed race. There is, you know, in in England, obviously in places like Cardiff and so on, and you know, you see, you know, and um, and the, um, you know, there's still that debate whether Tom Jones is mixed race or not. But that'll be on for eternal, right? But, <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm the product of the the, the white Irish mother and, and the African Caribbean Jamaican father, and a lot of my generation who are mixed race had Irish mothers, right? So. Do you think that connectivity was because there were two both marginalised communities who came together? What, what, what's your opinion on it? Well, my mum, you know, my mum was from North Wales. And I remember, re- you know, many years ago going to Cardiff. And when I said, you know, I said, look, my mum's from Wales. And they said, which part of Wales? And, they, and I said, North Wales. And they said, well, no, she's not from Wales. Uh, <laughs> and Ireland, where are you from? Northern Ireland. Well, you, you're not Irish because unless you're yeah. from Southern Ireland. Uh, yeah. Same with Scotland. And I think that when you start to look at the history of the UK, and if you look at diversity within the UK, I mean, we've black people have been here from 55 BC. So there's we're there at the court of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. So for me, when I, my mum was one of the Welsh people that refused to speak the Welsh language. So she never really embraced Welsh nationalism because what she felt is, is that it was imposed. And she talked a lot to me about nationalism. You know, it, it's ironic when I start working in prison and I said, look, have you got any books on Welsh nationalism? I said, yes. Scottish nationalism, yes. Irish nationalism, yes. I said, black nationalism. It's like, no. <laughs> what did that mean? My mum introduced me to nationalism. She introduced me to the division amongst white people, racially, who were separated out amongst class massively. My stepfather also was from Ireland. And even though he was quite brutal as a person, he had a finite knowledge of the division within Ireland itself, and he would talk about that. So when you start to look at the history of Britain and the struggles that we've had, is that we've been able to make some sense of the division in relationship to capitalism and defined class class ideas. But what's happened is, We've only focused really on racism, which is a binary between black and white. We haven't Mm. really focused on, when we look at the division amongst black people, we look at inter-island rivalry, which is never talked about. We look at uh, colorism, just difference in terms of color skin. So when we look at at white people, what we never really look at, and which people are a bit more... um, and, and you, you'll see now words like white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy. Those are racialized terms. Um, somebody who's white fragile can come from a working class or an upper class background. Somebody who's a white supremacist could come from the worst working class background and still be racist. So race actually in itself is a very different form of understanding to yeah. class it's very clear when you're looking at class although it's sophisticated in 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 its way but it's the close proximity to capitalism but when it comes to race and the racial divide as an example if we're being honest about it we live in a society that's polarized around racism white privilege and all of that stuff during the apartheid regime one of Nelson, uh, steve biko One of his best friends was Donald Woods. Malcolm X was commended by the white left. They never liked his stance because they felt personally attacked. But Malcolm X had white friends. I also know that in the Black Panther movement, you had the White Panthers. What I'm trying to say is is that the issue of race for white people has never been addressed as an issue. When we look at the Ku Klux Klan, that's clearly an heightened form of extreme terrorism rooted in a racialized context. But it's never argued as such in that way. The way in which the reverse, if it's a a young Muslim, or the way if it's uh, somebody suffers from black rage, like Colin Ferguson in 1976, 
So the vernacular that defines race is also predicated on who drives that narrative. So hence, hence black on black crime. Why yeah. So when so when we say langu power. language is power, whoever controls the language of the narrative has the power to determine the perception and the labeling of that narrative. So so what I'm dealing with is 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 the fact that race, class, why intersectionality becomes important because in a contemporary sense it gives an opportunity to begin to stop seeing everything as parallel lines because there are intersections yeah. and it's not just about mixed race identity because if you unless you're coming unless you're continental african the idea i mean you know racial mixing goes back thousands of years okay. Of course. But so within the but within the construction and division of society, yeah, we've divided society on a whole series of class, race, and gendered and sexualized constructs. But the one feature, which is the elephant in the room, which we see playing out time and time again, is race. So let me ask you then. So with, with, with the nineties, and then we move into the, the the kind of multiculturalism, coming out multiculturalism into community cohesion now. Right, these are these words. So assimilation, multiculturalism, community cohesion. But just on that basis, yeah. when it was assimilation, our elders basically say you must do as the white man do. So at yeah. school, we were socialized to a classic example would be chips. You know, I remember when chips come out or crisps, you know, when we started having crisp sandwiches, or we basically we were eating the same food, drinking the same drink, doing the same thing. When we had multiculturalism, the philosophy was we need to understand them because we weren't having it. You get excluded for speaking like you, but if you say cha or kiss your teeth, you get excluded. So in 1976, we had the Swan Report. The Swan Report said linguistic deprivation is the reason that black people are not educated. So we have educational ESN units, educational subnorm, educationally subnormal. So we, what's called pupil referral, we were called ESN, educational subnormal. Yeah. So when we had multiculturalism, the argument was, let's all blend everything together so we can share. But it was more like a big social experiment to understand those people. We were born in England. We were speaking the same stuff, but we were treated different, but not based on our cultural differences, based on the color of our skin. So I'm just trying to fill in that. So when it comes to yeah. community cohesion, that's when they started to realize that if you trace the timeline to the 90s, we had riots in 1976, 81, 83, 85, and we didn't really have a riot. So when we get into the 90s now... Can, we, I, just do yeah. something? Can I just do something? Yeah, it's just <laughs> taking that, right? Because here's the thing. You said something about the Swan Report. I want you to go back. Well, 1976. About language, because when we talk about black and black crime, let's talk about language. What you said there about the Swan Report. Well, 1976, the, what was happening in schools? Uh, we were rebelling. I was in a grammar stream. So I was in the top. I was the only black person in a predominantly like grammar. I wasn't in a grammar school. I was in the grammar stream. I was in the top set at school. But it was very evident when I was at school that all the other people in the lower classes were black. All the people that were pushed forward for sports were black. In careers advice, be a motor mechanic, join the Air Force. Yeah. But what happened is, the way that when we was at school, and certainly my observation was, is the fact that when we back chatted, um, the, the weapon that was used against teachers was the language. But what happened is, the assumption was as far back in 1976, that's when we had the Notting Hill riots. So if you parallel it, 1976, we had the Notting Hill riots. The Swan Report came out in 1976 and its underpinning value was linguistic deprivation. It felt that we didn't, we couldn't speak properly. We didn't grasp the vernacular. And we couldn't take instruction. We were defiant. And it was part of the culture we came from. And so there was rebellion. The relevance of it is, when you look at the time, ESN units, we were called educationally subnormal, which meant that out of that, the recommendations were we needed to go into these, um, that are now seen as pupil referral units, but they were seen as ESN units. So we've seen educationally subnormal. 
below the norm. So in 1976, there's a famous image of a guy with a like um, uh, a baseball bat hammering a, a policeman driving his car forward, reversing backwards, and he smashes it. 1976 was, as I then said, back to Africa. Linton Kwesi Johnson son his letter about a, a guy who was serving a life sentence for beating a policeman in police custody. And then Steel Post come along, Tree Babylon Mech, I and I run. So in that time, that's what happened in 1976. So oh, what happened? So yeah. so therefore, what started to happen is out comes the red, green, and gold. Out comes the sound system. Out comes the blues parties. Out comes Rasta. We all came, I'd say 76, we all came out. What okay, happened so, then you is... Mean, because I don't want to... I don't, I just, I, I, what you're saying, and it's reading a lot of the comments here, that people are feeling what you're saying. But I want to... I want to... What I'm... What I'm... What I'm, I'm and this is, this is... You know, there's a beautiful saying that you give someone their flowers while they're here, right? And, and, and I only usually run this show for an hour, but I'm going to go until until the wheels come off. What's key for me, because we cannot talk about conflict and can't, cannot talk about racial justice and cannot talk about community cohesion without understanding the journey of primarily, in our, in our con context anyway, the African and African Caribbean community. And so we're now when we've seen marches in 2020 in Trafalgar Square and people running after each other, it's because of some of the shortcomings in these areas that you're mentioning where people, and correct me if, you, if, you, if I'm wrong, people were not fit, did not feel that they were included in the conversation around equality and diversity. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would go further than that. It's like, um, even though we establish our, our own sense of identity, you know, um, I would say, you know, we had the red, green, and gold. We had the reggae music. We had all of that. But you couldn't get access to clubs. You couldn't get access to certain things. I, I remember, I mean, when we see marches nowadays, there's a sense that some of what you see in that 2020, very much the vestiges of the civil rights movement, because Black Lives Matter is very much like civil rights. People are looking for to be treated, to, to get access. Human rights is a different thing. We were more human rights. We weren't treated as human beings. And therefore, the way we were treated initially made us hostile. But then when Rasta came along, Rasta said, hold on, that we're reasonable about this. So we became more tactical. So what we would do is occupy buildings because we understood that we could. We started to organize because we studied the white left and we realized that they could march down the street because under the law you can march down the street we didn't realize when we marched down the street there was a different reception committee so when we went to i remember gregory isaacs gregory isaacs in the 80s i think 1983 come out with a tune called black i kill black whoa well, 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 bones right back whoa. i remember when that tune come out when I, uh, Junior Mervyn, Police and Thieves, you know, when yeah. you think about the music and then you heard Bernie Spear. Bernie Spear started singing and Mighty Diamonds and the Abyssinians were telling us they never listened to Marcus Garvey. So who's Marcus Garvey? We had to read about Marcus Garvey. Look back to Africa. And then when Aswad and Steel Pulse and the Naturalites come in. Yeah. And then you had Coxon and Mafia and Shaka. Every sound dance, every so, so, all so the you, reggae music was a rallying cry that said, you know something, not only we're we gonna have civil disobedience, but what we're gonna do, we are gonna give you the fuel for your thinking. So when you're out there, if you get hit, you're getting hit for a reason. So there's my point. You said about it wasn't for entertainment sake, it was like what KRS used to refer to as edutainment. So, you know, that edutainment. So You've they've gone through that. It's almost been a, a shedding of a skin. You've got a, you've got a generation that doesn't connect with wind, Windrush wholeheartedly, but also is not felt that they're welcomed by the host community. 
we come through all that. And if you see some of those pictures, I'm sure you might be even in those pictures of Hansworth Park and Beverly Hyde Park. I just saw berets and afros when I see it, those old black and white pictures. It looked like it was Oakland, California with the Panthers. So the 90s come and let's be very, very honest about this. Cracklands, right? Crack and a certain type of music. Well, let, let, let me tell you the, the actual time they're not come in. What happened is Margaret Thatcher was in and Ronald Reagan got in. And as a consequence of that, what we called right realism, we were in an area where we, we entered into neoconservatism. When Ronald Reagan got in and the situation in Nicaragua, you know, the, it's about understanding the world at that time. Thatcher was intolerant. The, she destroyed the miners. When she teamed up with Reagan, they were charismatic. Their views really carried weight in politics. And so when crack first came out, I remember the first two years when crack first came out because I was doing a show in Leeds with Saxon where people who sold weed in Leeds suddenly were faced with crack dealers. So they had a, a, a concert to draw attention to crack coming in from people that sold weed. I mean, that's how it was. But what happened is when Thatcher and Reagan came together and declared the war on drugs, that was in itself, that was a pandemic. Because what started out is, and if you trace the evolution of the, the word yardy culture, because prior to that time, cocaine was for rich people. Heroin was what? rock musicians would have we had weed it was cheaper it was more organic it was connected to a cultural heritage like yeah. rasta if he was into rasta but, yeah. But, yeah. But, but what happened is crack as processed cocaine suddenly began to find its way from the rich pickings because you had cocaine, heroin, which was class A drugs, or be seen as class A drugs now, which were the domain of the rich or people who could afford it. But when cocaine suddenly found a different market that was processed and made into crack, that created a new drugs market. But that new drugs market not only led to um, organized crime shifting its focus, because now you could leverage and when it was the rich and famous, there was a kind of, it, there was a sexy and cute element to snorting cocaine. Um, a, a musician like Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, it, it was kind of fashionable to take recreational hardcore drugs. That was the thing, puking up and playing music and yeah. for quite bohemian. But when crack came in, what you suddenly realize is, is that suddenly that started the route to um, a massive increase in uh, criminal justice processes, violence mm. beyond recognition. What happened when crack first formulated in, 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 in America, that sent a message out to the Caribbean. And then suddenly within the Caribbean, there were people that wanted to be involved. And so then you start, if you look in the 80s, on the kind of raging wars from the Caribbean to, to New York and Chicago, where Caribbean gangsters were very much part of that. But but if you look at Frank Lucas and Melvin Williams, Melvin Williams for Baltimore, Frank Lucas, cocaine, heroin. That was in the 50s and early 60s. If you then fast forward 20 years later, you get a similar kind of thing. But what, what and I remember speaking to Melvin Williams, who's dead now, and he was called little, uh, you know, little Melvin. He was the Baltimore equivalent of Frank, of Frank Lucas. And yeah. he said to me, I said, why did you put Baltimore on heroin? And he basically said, Martin, when I went to prison for the first time, everybody in there looked like me. And I, and I said, I, he said, I just hated it. And he said to me, you know, Martin, a few of us got together. And what happened is what people don't understand a lot of the time is that considering we come from, at the time, low socioeconomic backgrounds, people push money into leveraging resources that enabled African-American Caribbean gangsters to make money. 
But what so, we've always what we've always focused on historically is yeah. is the gangsters. Whether it's thing, this is well, this is why this is what you're saying is so important because our parents did not identify with the, that label of yardi. For a start, that wasn't you know we talk about use the word the use of the word nigger. We talk about things like yardi. We talk about um, even some people you know have conversations with young people. I remember my dad used to, when he used to see, for example, when people see as like a pillar of the first being one of the first, and, and this is not to put any shade on Lenny Henry, but my dad used to hate seeing Lenny Henry on Tiswas. Condensed milk, hard or bread, big rasta hat, muckery, because he used to say, that is not who we are, no. right? That is not who we are. So in my, in, in, and, 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 you know, I quite often say to people, 90 plus percent of people from the Caribbean came to the UK with a qualification or a trade zero with a um, criminal um, criminal record and but also we... they, they also came with sunday suits they yep. came with a, a dress code uh they came with a sense of pride and purpose and what happened is we watched that get eroded so we we went the opposite way yep. and we created our own stuff and so by the time you get into the 80s when you get thatcher Nobody really understood that the mixing of drugs to and the way crack was created. One is the addictive nature of crack was so quick that the drugs market seized this opportunity because you you know people were addicted virtually instantaneously, and as a consequence of that, you could sell more drugs. But when you look at American drugs policy in the 80s and you look at who it was targeted to. I, 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 I haven't got the statistics, but I can guarantee that um, if you look at how many middle class white people who took cocaine were prosecuted and went to jail for indeterminate life sentences, very, very few. Musicians would say, look at the maxim, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Imagine if you said now sex, drugs and hip hop, everybody would be up in arms, but it was OK back then. Mm. But in the 80s. So what happened when crack came in and the violence came in, what you started to realize is, is that as the gangs in America in particular started to form and they came into conflict with other kind of gangs, and this was before we got to our young people being involved in gangs in the way it was, what you also started to look at is the way that in which people like the Crips and the Bloods and the Mexican cartels and all those gangs suddenly started to organize themselves to protect their profits. But what that did do, it brought American criminal justice policy to neoconservatism, which meant that the era of mass incarceration began to take off in that particular period, purely on the basis that the level of hostility, ferocity, what it gave Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in those 80s periods by identifying with each other opportunities to almost leverage a new population in prison. Because remember, in the African-American prison population, uh, offenders were used in so many different ways regarding the American economy as a, as a cheap labor force. And so yeah. therefore, what you started to realize politically, you've got all of these people locked up. They couldn't vote, for one. They were locked away. The families were disjointed. So suddenly in the 80s, crack began to do what they did in the Industrial Revolution. The, the whole fragmentation within families, communities were split, communities were split along many different guides. And so what happens is the fracture, and, and I'm talking about a massive fracture, it's like a, a fault line within communities. So, so, just... so, so when we bring that back to here, because that generation, my parents' generation, they bought their houses, right? They didn't live in social housing. Etc. And then you see this increase in social housing across Birmingham, for example, Ladywood, Borsal Heath, um, Neachels, right? So these, these high, you know, communities full of social housing situations. And now all of a sudden you have these silos, right? These kind of like, for once in a better word, ghettos, right? So I remember growing up, Ladywood was referred to as um, Bitter Creek or Nam, Vietnam. Obviously, Borsal Heath was Southern. You had Hands of known as ghetto, but this is the second, this is the grandchildren now of the Windrush era. And so, so when we, 
when we when we look now, all of a sudden they've gone from high achieving, skilled um, people who come to the UK to help support rebuild after the war. Within two generations now, you have these communities where people aren't homeowners per se. Some of them are working at Rover and Lucas and HP Source, but to break that cycle, because what but, but remember, see, just, just in that context, when our parents came across, they used partner, they used alternative forms of banking, and they leverage they leverage the money to help each other. Yeah. Me, our generation, we didn't do partner. We leveraged money through employment. We And when I was growing up, there was fairly full employment. But what happened is, is that within the 80s in particular, that black people went from, I don't want to work in a factory, I don't want to be like my parents, to suddenly I want to work for local authority. I want to be a youth worker. I want to be a social worker. Suddenly, there's an aspirational class of people. People wanted to move from a council house. I mean, when Thatcher, you know, she deconstructed and said, look, you can start to buy your own house. People started buying their own houses. Elders didn't buy council houses. They bought their own houses. Yeah. It was my generation that started to buy their council houses. And anyway, so, so what started to happen is that if you then look at how families were constructed in from the 80s and going into the 90s, our connection to the economy, you started to see a very different shift in patterns of mobility, uh, the haves, the have-nots. So what happens is if you study, if you look at the sociology of it is, you, you almost, if you go back to the writings of the time, sociologists and black commentators predicted all of this. But what happened is before the days of uh, Black Lives Matter and Black History Month, remember in the 90s, you find me, anybody in your generation that could say, in our library, we had black books. If you could find me anybody that said, oh, I listened, I went to a reasoning session. Nah, this was the days when hip hop just started to come in. This is the days when it was dancing. We wanted to look good. This has been high tops and fades. And so therefore we were saying, you know something, we weren't, we weren't paying attention to some of the other stuff that was going on. And then what happens is, you know, when I was growing up, my daughters were young, they were growing up. And then suddenly our kids turned teenagers. And suddenly what we realize is we was in a council house, whereas our parents had bought their own house. What we realize is, is we were going to record in a white person's studio. We didn't own our own studio. And then we, we didn't realize that James Brown brought his own plane. We didn't realize that James Brown had a studio. We, didn't, we, didn't, we thought that Sammy Davis Jr., and Nat King Cole, they just had straight hair and they were dancers and singers. We didn't realize what they went through. So we were thinking, well, we got it sussed. And then when you start to look at drugs, we started to get into an area in the 90s, an area of extreme blocked opportunity. So if you look at 1993, the Labour Party in 1993, the prison population doubled at that particular moment in time. So when you start to look at the rise over here, it was parallel to what was happening in the States. Why? Yeah. Because of blocked opportunity. Because what we suddenly realize is, yes, you could have an education, but we didn't have a degree. We didn't have this. We didn't get promotion. We didn't do this. So suddenly, there's a generation that turned towards criminal activity. But that was in conflict with people that came from the Caribbean over here. You know, at the time, we didn't have East European organized no. crime over here. So what we started to do is have an infighting. Now, what we call black on black crime, that wasn't like that. What you had in the 90s and certainly leading up to 2000, people would say those Jamaicans or those. It was never Africans because Africans never came into this, but it was always the Yardies. So even if yeah. somebody come from Barbados, somebody could come from Trinidad, the word Yardie became a symbol of a, a person who was involved in criminal activity who had no fear. Yeah. A, a bit like the rude boy in the 50s in Jamaica, ruled it all fear, nor why. Jamaican, my, my family, one of my cousins in Jamaica was a, was a Jamaican gangster. And he used to tell me when I sit with him, I said, Bridget, why is it so, so much man come to the UK? And he said, Martin, it's easy. He said, in Jamaica, it was harder. And it wasn't harder to rob people and steal. But basically, Jamaica was not prosperous at that moment in time. The spoils wasn't there. People didn't go to North America just like that. But Britain was seen as the place to go because we were perceived as quite weak and soft. And so when Caribbean gangsters came across, there was a predatory nature, an inter-conflict. And if you look at 
Scotland Yard at the time, the, the famous case of Eaton Green, where when he was arrested for robbing a blues in Nottingham, basically disclosed his connection to Scotland Yard. And at the time, there was a lot of... Um, the police at the time were bringing known gangsters over to, to, to create panic and mayhem in communities. And so therefore, there was an early sense where we began to other ourselves. We were scared of people who came from the same island as our parents. Who, so was that, was, that, was that when that, the notion of black and black crime was introduced as a word? Not really. I mean, if you listen to Gregory Isaacs, black, I kill black. You know, um, you know what, Mike? Every time, you always... sing, every time you sing, I'm sorry, bro, but I can't help it. But, you know, but to catch you singing deserves. Let me just turn the light on. Let me just turn the light on. For me, when, when you look at the, when you look at the term black on black, yeah, what when you start to look at the the term black on black, it didn't really enter into the 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 way we look at stuff like the word waste man until quite long down the line because the conflict in the 90s in particular going into the 2000s was mainly intercultural it just so happened that intercultural were fighting over the same market young black men over here were saying hold on why are they coming from over there to do this and so when you start to look in birmingham and nottingham where you now start to get some of the legendary conflicts within gangs, whether it's London. That was because as my generation started to get into its 30s and its 40s, you had a generation who was 14, 15, and they were growing up with parents who were either in the church and they rejected it, or they were Rasta and they rejected it. And in care, they were getting kicked out of school. So they saw an opportunity. You know, these were kids that would watch Kid and Play. These were people that, you know, were watching Will Smith, you know, Bill Cosby. Yeah. But what happened is, at the time in popular culture, everybody tried to make out it was roses at the end of the garden. So you've only got to look at the TV at the time where Lenny Henry, Tiz was, all of this stuff coming on. But when we got into the 90s, as we were coming close to um, 2000, there was a big anticipation for the, the millennium. And then suddenly our children are growing up and suddenly they have a different awareness to us because a lot of us were working for local authority. A lot of us were youth workers. We were professionals. And our kids were saying, well, yo, so they were saying to us what we were saying to our parents. And we were saying to them, listen, yeah, if you work hard, if you get a degree, da, 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 da. and then what happened is the prison population went up policing intensified so somehow the narrative that we're telling our young people wasn't matching up because mm. by by the millennium remember we talk about the millennium generation and one of the things that they talk about it's the it's a greedy generation the, the generation the, the generation so what happened is the aspiration shifted they no longer wanted that why do i want to get a salary now nah, i want a car because at the time go back to 2000 Look who the hip hop artists were. Look at the R and B artists. Look at the music that was at the time. It was aspiration. It was about bare chests and silk shirts. It was about cars. It was about. It no was way. about. It was about African Americans were saying you can get the American dream on the back of hip hop, even if you come from an ex. You used to sell drugs. Yeah, we didn't have that over here. So we were looking at the Americans and saying, "Yo, we want what they've got," but we couldn't do it. But we so a lot of our from 2000 aspired to be African American culture. So you, didn't really you, embrace yeah. Caribbean culture. It was very much African American culture, but a certain type of African American culture that was much more that talked to. I want things. When so we were about, growing up, we didn't, consumerism, right? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, because when we were growing up, I I, I can't remember seeing cars on the street. Anytime you see a man in a car, you say, yo, oh, my God, my man's got a car. When consumerism, and I'm talking about extreme consumerism, kicked in, 
at the, from from round about the year 2000 suddenly what we realize is is that we fought all of these arguments and gains because we wanted to settle down have a house a picket fence we wanted to feel comfortable yeah. but americans in their consumerism suddenly discovered the american dream on the back of hip hop on the back of r and b and they realized they could produce uh, lots of things comedy um started to emerge i used to looking at that and they still do they were looking at trainers they were looking at tracksuits they were looking at all of this stuff but they couldn't get it in a uk context so once again blocked opportunities so what happens is drugs okay. so in the early part of the year if you look at the i wouldn't say the demise but when organized gangsters from the caribbean started to dissipate what started to happen is then the playing field was just us yeah. and yeah. that meant that if you look at the term black on black crime well if you look at it ecologically you've got people who just live in the same area in close proximity it's almost like having nat west around your corner you don't have to go to the city center i mean i've never seen anybody you know go to the bank in hansworth nat west bank in hansworth and say yo it's a black bank it just so happens that it's located in the area where the diversity is quite big so when i when i started to encounter black on black crime it was very strange because i'd go to prison and they'd say yo this man killed this person and he was black but then i realized that that what we started to do is pathologize the behavior as opposed to looking at the underlying factors that led to the behavior in the first place because i was around white guys in jails who were killing people left right and center and that term was never applied whereas to our young people when we said black on black crime we applied it and we created a particular mythology around a black on black crime so so my point being is is the fact that like labeling you know we had young people from culturally diverse backgrounds hemmed in together at school in youth clubs whether it's oakland's wherever it was but what happened is is that when you look at the diversity and when you look at things at the time the people were very violent toward each other on all communities but what happens or what happened and you've got to go back to 1976 when um stuart hall wrote police in the crisis yeah what you started to realize is there's a kind of social fascination with black people who are violent and so therefore social scientists started to see this as a phenomenon words like black masculinity black hyper masculinity came around father deficit um all of these things came out to try and give a rational explanation now how i challenged that and i did yeah. in 1843 a young black Afri african-american called william freeman was overexposed to racism in a prison he went to prison in auburn in new york in 90 in, in uh, when he was 15. he came out five years later he'd been beaten a lot and he came to the authorities and he he um said to the authorities i know who did this crime please go and arrest them it wasn't me the authorities told him to go away he murdered four white people and he was found not guilty on appeal and he was and it's led to a term called black rage mm. which came from what's called the mcnaughton rules in 1843 where a white guy called daniel mcnaughton tried to assassinate um the mr peel who created the police force which led to the case of insanity the first case in british legal history of insanity in 1843 the same legal defense was tried in america and they proved that racism led to a lapse a temporary lapse of concentration it was referred to as the black rage defense the relevance of it is as far back as 1843 it's been accepted that the overexposure to something like race and extreme poverty leads to a temporary lapse of uh, control which leads to a violent outcome therefore so so therefore there is a history within this country where the exposure to violence uh, or the the exposure to extreme poverty as charles dickens talked about 
Shakespeare had Romeo and Juliet, which was a gang fight. So therefore, the question we have to ask is, why in the beginning of 20, uh, 2000 did we suddenly start looking at black on black crime when we had Operation Trident? We had all of these responses, but historically, we've always had young people. Oliver Twist was massively abused. You know, Fagin ran a gang. Charles Dickens wrote about this, mm -hmm. right? And you saw the way people were treated, which led to outpouring. So, so what I'm dealing with is, is what, hap what I also think, where I also challenged it, is that in 1920-something, when Carter G. Woodson wrote um, The Miseducation of the Negro, Black History Month emerged from that for the training of white historians to challenge racism as a way of showing black people the truth about history so they wouldn't rebel and riot. So if you look at the narrative that we've never been had, because we've spent so much time trying to get a house, trying to be this, trying to be that, what we've not done is studied the history that will explain how those conditions came about and why they're about enough to make different choices so, about, so, so, about that history. So interesting. So you, you mentioned Oliver Twist. So let's 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 bring let's bring a let's bring it forward. There's a young person in inner city, an inner city young um, community within a major city. They're doing they're amazingly doing well at school. Prim, at primary school, they're, they're smashing it at primary school. I mean, these, these, with the right support, these 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 this young these young people could go on to grammar school easily. But you know, they don't go through the process, and now they're now they're left. They can only choose four schools in a catchment area, and two or two or three out of those schools have been in special measures in the last seven to eight years. So, although they're academically high achievers, are you saying that because of poverty they can only go to these four schools in this catchment area, which have high well, levels of deprivation? If you look at it within our society, mobility is tied to employment, education. Um, and economics, which means that if you're denied those three, your attainment to be able to get a foothold in any of those is limited, and therefore you get blocked opportunities. Therefore, if systemically you create the conditions to have an area that's impoverished, you rob people of education. In robbing people of education, you rob them of health. If you rob them of health, you rob them of other tools required to be socially mobile. In an economy like ours now, which is service-oriented, it's not like factories where you needed lots of people. So what you have is a society that's structured where only a certain amount of people can be employed at one time. That's why if you look at COVID-19, yeah. how many of our young people are involved in service industries, music, so many fantastic recreational opportunities? But what happens is COVID kicks in, What's the first thing to disappear? What's the what's the thing that you're least liable to preserve? Not that youth club, not that recording studio, not that yeah. nightclub, not that food. Boom, all of those things disappear. So that if you deal with it on a personal level, that mother who's got a son who she's struggling with, she doesn't have the capacity because she's been exposed to the same level of deprivation and marginalization as her child. She's just normalized it because she's managed to be able to manage it. But to that 11 and 12 year old who's now being told you've got to wear a mask, um, that actually under COVID-19, the economy is going to take 10 years to recover. Suddenly what you realize is, is that suddenly now everybody wants to, what's ironic is everybody wants to read. You know, white people are saying, what books do I need to read to educate black people? What you realize is, and if you go back to Carter G. Woodson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, they already knew that. They already knew way back as far back as the, the reconstruction post-slavery there would be a first come first serve there would be like the america first syndrome that hasn't changed but what has changed is social media kicks in and the relevance of it is is because once upon a time if you wanted to find out if your belly was hurting and your parents said your mom and my belly is hurting she said you must go to the library and you would have to get a book and you'd have to be able to read that book and you'd have a dictionary next to that book to find it out. Now, that's not the case. It's like on Google. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what I'm dealing with is, is, is that we now have a culture that the way that it accesses information for change is questionable because what happens is, is that whether people like it or not, that most factual books, biased as they may be, come from a place where somebody's done some research, even if you don't agree with what they're saying. Our young people, to an extent, are not trained in researching themselves because the information required for them to learn does not come from social media. So my point being is, is that it's complex, but it's also quite predictable because why is it we have words like urban, suburban, suburban, urban? Yeah. Then we also have rural. So if you look at the way society is constructed, if you go into a rural community, people will talk about, we have a sense of community. Every, we know everybody in the post office, the local pub, da, 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 community. They're tied to shared values to protect the sanctity of a small group of people that occupy a space that where it's clean air, it's familiar. Suburban is people who are midway between the inner city and rural. But what do they say? We have a community. We have a strong sense of who we are. I know my neighbor. I know the person across the road. Inner cities from the Industrial Revolution are still tied to work. And people know each other mainly through work. So when we define the notion of community within an inner city context, the moment the work that define that community, whether it's through factories, whether it's through a mine, the moment that disappears, then the community disappears with it. Whereas in a rural community, you've only got to see with floods. When the floods come out, everybody comes together, sandbags on the house. There's a real sense of community. In the inner city, the, the dominant feature that defines people is work. And when that work disappears, you then get the, the evolution of subcultures. And those subcultures will occupy a range of different spaces to take care of the, their basic needs. But if the opportunity legitimately to get those basic needs is not available, they so, still want to get those basic needs. And hence, you get the emergence of um, where and, and where you analyze it is not based on who's a criminal. It's who gets policed the most. So, so, when, so, when, so when we lose Rover and Sheffield lose the steel and Hull lose the fishing and Manchester lose the mill and Liverpool you lose the duck, what you're saying is this leaves a vacuum and if it's not replaced with something because you're saying the working class were built around work. Yeah, and, 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 and it leaves a vacuum. And bougie restaurants, it's replaced with bougie restaurants and, and um, exposed brick gourmet burger stores, right? Um, it alienates the working class. And so what you start to see parallel to this is a decline in health and well-being mm. because the level of stress to survive increases the risk you're prepared to take because the pain is too great increases but the tension and the anxiety also increases that means that within an inner city and it's a, th a term called anime at a time of massive social upheaval uh emil durkheim wrote this in the 1800s and he talked about anime at a time of social um decline the old rules no longer exist so kids start saying, yo, but that was your, you know, your parents say, listen, when I was young, well, no, it's not the same anymore. So my point being is, is the fact that the old rules not only no longer apply, but what you also notice is that drug dealers, alcohol, substance misuse, pandemic, diabetes, putting weight on, depression. What happens is there'll be certain people will supply the impact of that. Drugs, alcohol, substance misuse, violence, if needs be, to collect money. So what starts to happen is the whole cycle starts again. And all that happens is, all that's happened is, we as once upon a time, when six police burst into our house, there was no CCTV, there was no cameras to pick it up. 
and it became community gossip. Like, you never hear what happened last night. Now, what we have is trial by phone. Yeah, it's live, isn't it? It's real time. Yeah, so, so what we have now is where you can have an incident and spot it up. Like, you can have a... Sh I remember back in the day, Carry On movies were 15. They were seen as... You couldn't watch it. If you was young, you couldn't watch a Carry On movie. Oh, no, no. Now, you, now you, the guy you, that was shot the other day, Jacob, what did you see? You you can watch that shooting live. What I'm dealing with is the basic... So let, me ask, let me ask you something, Dr. Glynn. This is really profound. And some people are mentioning here that this is so valuable. And I think we're going to have to do a part two. Okay. Um, because I think, you know, it's rich. Um, and there's a lot of gems here. In this era of, I don't know if it's post-COVID, but we're still in COVID, where it's interesting, I was walking yesterday and I saw a queue and the queue was probably about 30 meters for, for, for half price food in a restaurant. Now it's interesting, right? So you've got these communities, predominantly BAME, and, I, and even the word BAME, we'll talk about it on the yep. next show. I this, yep. These communities queuing up for an hour to get food at 50% off in a, in a pandemic. Yep. So we're boosting the economy, but also there's risk pertaining to that. Yeah, but, but just on that basis, if you go back to Charles Dickens, if you go back to the Victorian era, people would eat crap meat. People would drink the worst drinks. Yeah. People would. So the issue is, is as the human condition improve that much well poverty is poverty whether mm. it's in the 1800s 1900s people will say well you've got phones you've got cars we're more civilized now but mm -hmm. but i i can tell you and i know i'm not a muslim and i remember asking a friend of mine four days into ramadan Bridget, how do you do that because i know for most of us when we said well i'm starving it means we haven't eaten for three hours and we'll, we'll if somebody said to you, look, here's a crisp, we'd feel full up. But when you're faced with Weetabix, two inches of milk with three children, with two pounds worth of gas on the yep. meter, and you have to make that choice, and suddenly somebody gives you a fiver, the idea of standing in line for, for an hour, it's not going to perturb you because yep. that, is seen by people who have nothing as a reward, as opposed to it's not a reward. But what happens is when you have nothing, having something becomes everything. And I'm saying that the roots of this and the manifestation of it does not change. But what happens is, and this is my, I suppose, as a closing argument to this statement, um, you asked me at the beginning of this if I want to mention about my new book. Well, I'm going to mention it, and I'm going to mention it for a reason. I have spent all my life writing and reading, and I've published lots of books. But finally today, I got my first book deal for a history book. And the title of the book is called Silent Voices, The Black Presence in Crime and Punishment from 1750 to 1900. I purposely didn't say black people from 1750 to 1900. I wanted to look at the black presence because by looking at where we were at that time between 17 from the reign of George III to Queen Victoria, we were present in a range of ways. Now, historically, when we look at the 1700s to 1900s, we look at our presence through the lens of slavery. So the governance on how we look at the presence that we had is either slavery or being subordinate, uh, subordinate marginalized. From 1750 to 1900, that was not the case. We contributed in the shaping of the way working class politics is, are, is criminal justice, the culture at the time. But what's happened is, and this is the point I'm trying to make, we, unless we revise our understanding of history, learn the lessons from that revision and apply that revision, we will continue to perpetuate a cycle that we think it's only happening now. As an example, 
if we take Black Lives Matter, Black Lives the Matter, same, Black Li well, Black Lives Matter has in, issued a range of, like a, you know, they, they, they advocate things. But then in the Chartist movement, they did, the Cato Street Conspiracy, the um, Guy Fawkes issued a plan, the Black Panthers issued a plan. What I'm dealing with is, if you study the failure of movements, it's because we don't study the movements that's gone before where they went wrong to not make the same mistakes. Let's take civil rights. There's a big difference between civil and human rights. When somebody asks me about Black Lives Matter, I'm not going to criticize Black Lives Matter. I'm not going to do that. But Black Lives Matter is more akin to civil rights. But there are many parts of our community that are not seen as human beings, which means human rights advocacy is not the same as civil rights, civil rights advocacy. We have a local authority that is about civic participation. It's about civil rights. But we have people who are treated less than human, people who are beaten by the police, people who have to sleep rough. There's a whole section of people who are treated less than human beings. But they're, they, they're not, they can't protest. Rough sleepers cannot mount a protest about how they're treated. Um, the, the people that go to food banks are not going to be able to mount a protest. So what I'm dealing with is, is the fact that why I write and why after years this history book becomes important. And I feel akin to Carter G. Woodson. My book, my new book, is not to be read to raise awareness or, oh, this is what we've done, or to slap people across the face. That's not what it's about. What it's about is through people looking at my work, I'll be going through transcripts. I won't be reading other people's books. It's an incentive to say to people, be an investigative journalist. Investigate the past. Investigate this before you make a claim. Study the Chartist movement. Study what went before. Identify the gap and fill that gap. As an example, one classic, classic example is Jamie Oliver and food. Jamie Oliver tried to mobilize the government around getting better food in schools. And he did quite well. He got access to, um, he did quite well. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't understand, the Black Panthers, they ran meal services for kids who never had food. Yep. during that time when we talk about the black panthers we talk about bobby seal we talk about we talk about the violence that this people got shot we talk about that's what we talk about what we don't talk about is how did the black panthers how did the black panthers sustain feeding poor kids in the community uh, how, or, or nations as well Why? Yeah, um, yeah. how did they provide education so when i started reading Rereading the Black Panthers, I stopped looking at the highlights, the the, the violence, the poly. I stopped looking at that. I started listening to the testimonies of the children who are now big that said, you know something, when I was six, my mom never had no food. And she was in the Black Panthers and she would drop me off and I would have breakfast. Because the Black Panthers knew that children who had no food couldn't learn. But what do we say now? We don't think at times that we can do that. Yet, during Ramadan, the Muslim community, what were they doing? I've never seen a community mobilize themselves around providing food. Yet, during the pandemic, the dumpling shops. It wasn't K Kentucky shut down. McDonald's shut down. Mm. But our food shops kept it going. So... If you're listening to this and you've got a lot of money, go to those food shops and extend their kitchen and then study the legislation about how food on the NHS can be ordered. And therefore, you can provide food for elders, Caribbean elders, Asian elders. So therefore, one of the ways to use the economics that we have is rather than erect a, tra a shop on trainers or be campaigning against the library shutdown, take your resources and do the fundamental thing, which is to extend kitchens in local shops, 
in dumpling shops connect those kitchens to public and social policy. Therefore, because during Ramadan, we see it. Coming up to Christmas, we see it. Any time there is poverty, any time there is a need, the community looks at itself and says, you know something, we're going to eat tonight. We're going to have less food. We're going to share it. But what do they do? They provide food for the homeless. You know, nobody really talks about during Ramadan when people themselves want to eat. Yeah. How many, when they turn Birmingham New Street into a station for the homeless community, what I'm dealing with is I re studying how the Black Panthers circulated food with the children in the community. There is a template and a framework because in those autobiographical accounts, they tell you how they did it. Therefore, what I'm suggesting is, is the fact that, yes, if you've got an MBA, you can have a slick marketing campaign about your restaurant in Brindley Place. I can get that. But all I know is when you listen to the Black Panthers or you listen to the Muslim community, whether it's Friday prayers, whether it's announcements, the oral tradition, Grandmaster Flash, don't push me till I'm close to the edge. When you start to listen to hip hop, there's a narrative in hip hop that gives you a lot of information if you understand the code. What I'm trying to say is, because we've disconnected by and large from reading and writing, because that's the narrative we've been fed, well, the same like feeding the community's children food and organizing around that, we can feed our brains. And we can feed our brains in a way that you do it with food. You create a safe space where you serve food. You don't make people feel stigmatized just because they don't have food. You make them feel welcome. You make their belly full. You make them smile and you send them home ready for the next day. And it's the same thing when it comes to learning. I have so many people say, yo, Dr. Glynn, I'm dyslexic. I can't read. I, I can't understand big words. And what do we say? You must learn to read. You must learn. No. What feeding the mind is about and the brain is actually recognizing you've got to create the experience for that. That's why the restaurant experience. I've just got a book called Oversubscribed, and it said there are some restaurants where you wait six months to get in. <laughs> Certain dumpling shops, if you don't get there early, you've had it, right? And I'm saying in the way that we feed our brains, and they did it in Saturday schools, and the elders gave us information that in a contemporary sense, we have to create a learning experience. We're not telling someone that they've got to read. All we have to do is enable people to consume the quality of ideas as a form of food, but with the experience. So it's how we tell about learning, how we share it through storytelling, through hip hop, through music. That's what blues, jazz, Motown, gospel. I learned about Father Absence. The first time I've heard Papa was a Rolling Stone. Yeah. I said, yo, that's my dad. That came out. I, I remember when that came out. I said, yo, my dad's a Rolling Stone. Nobody come up to me and said, you know, do you realize that that's a, uh, you know, that's a, 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 a particular piece of work that centers on father absence? Where <laughs> they never did that. What they did, Papa was, I understood. My father was like a, I understood the metaphors. So I'm saying that every hip hop, grime, trap, drill artist, they speak the language. They've got that, they've got well, the ingredients. Know, okay, so is put I those ingredients. I'm going to what I do because, you know, if we start getting into tra trap and grime and drill, you know, we're going to be here till morning. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, because we're going to definitely going to do this over two sessions and you're going to be the first to break through, but I knew it anyway. But I want to end with something. So this will be um, part one. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll set a date for part two. So with all my guests, I ask them three questions called the three Ds. I want you to tell me your favorite dish, your favorite destination, and your dream as it relates to who you are as an individual. So what's your favorite dish first and foremost? My favorite dish is, um, which I do like, which I cook. Which is, I like ackee and salt fish, a, a green banana, hard. I like hard food with ackee and salt fish. And the reason I like that, right, is because 
there's a lot of food I eat, and then three or four hours later, I want to eat again. But mm. if I've acting saltfish and hard food with carrot juice or pineapple juice, that's it. I'm done for the day. I can't, you know, if they burgle my house, I can't chase someone because I just waited down. So, um, so I love that. Um, so destination. To tell you the truth, and I'm, this might sound a bit of a cop out. I've travelled widely. I've been. At my time now at 63, the greatest destination is my imagination. Wait, because I, you think as a great grandfather, you put that in there, because I only found that today. Yeah, You're yeah, great. I'm a great grandfather. And and the Maybe. thing about, for me, I, I love my imagination. And because in my imagination, there's no limits. I've been to some fantastic places. I've been to some famous places. But what I what I like is the world of my imagination, because I can go... I've, all right, if if you're saying a part of history, I'm a Star Trek fan, right? And even to this day, um, I'm not going to lie, is if I could go back and be with Spock and James T. Kirk on the bridge of the Enterprise. You're missing someone else out as well. Come on. So Everybody um, loved her. Everybody loved her. Come on. Well, listen, Lieutenant Uhuru, right? I saw Star Trek. Um, Uhuru when I was 11 it was the first black woman I'd seen wearing a short skirt and I just remembered right I'd never ever seen a woman like her and when I saw Spock and I saw Mr. Sulu Chekhov I never knew that it was multiculturalism personified and Gene Roddenberry who created the series created that but I just remembered wanting to be on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise because they they just there's just something magical. You know, I never really focused on the sets. I still watch it now, but I've always fancied that. Why? Because Afrofuturist like that, you know, that's a good point, Scotty. Oh no, everybody there and the thing about it is is that you know, aliens weren't all bad. And when I discovered Afrofuturism, I discovered that space is really important. And I, and I feel that Star Trek in particular took me out of, you know, there was no ghetto in space. And if it was, it was on a planet where there was always somebody trying to discover something that had a warped sense of humor. But what I loved about the dynamics, Spock was mixed race. And the interesting thing about Dr. Spock, you know, Spock, when he used to talk and James Kirk, Spock reminded me a lot of me and so did James Kirk. And I, I always remember how I never understood how Kirk listened to Spock, but people would never listen to me because I was emotional like James Kirk. And so when I think of the bridge of the Enterprise... You because you didn't have the death grip on the shoulder, that's why. No, well, you know something? Not, this is no word of a lie. When I was at school, I actually thought that I could do that. And I realized, you know, when you try someone at break time and you try to put your hand on the shoulder, it didn't work. And that's when you had to run off and you get slapped up. But the Starship Enterprise was to me the first because doctor who wasn't multicultural no doctor who was, i watched doctor who when it first came it wasn't multicultural um mm -hmm. lost in space wasn't multicultural fireball xl5 stingray thunderbirds none of that You've only Star been Trek. sorry i i know i'm going too far back so for me favorite destination so what was the last question as it pertains to racial justice in this country um, beyond moving beyond the hashtag and the press releases and you know everyone from PG tips right through to um, both selectors saying sorry or putting something out you know when we get to the the outcomes when we get to moving the needle around racial justice what is, what is your dream? What, what is it that you hope you can see on, on, a, on a realistic level for um, organizations in the uh, communities? Toni Morrison, the famous African-American writer, when she was asked why she don't have white people in her novels, she never said she wanted to exclude white people, but she just wanted to experience a world which was understood on our terms. One of my aspirations as a writer, as an academic, as a lecturer, I, I just as a general human being, it's not only do I want people to recognize their potential, and a lot of us do, 
those of us who know better need to create spaces where that potential can breathe and grow, which means it's not about replicating the old youth service or the, the old whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. As a lecturer, I see my students come in who are now having to face being in pandemic trying to get a degree. But we have to go back, and I go back to that history. It's to look at what did people do during the Black Plague, the fire of London? What did people do during the civil rights and human rights movement? What did people do during slavery? What you realize is out of slavery came blues and gospel and jazz. When you look at how that emerged, it's because some people said, I don't want to work. I'm not going to become a sharecropper. I'm not going to, I don't, the Ku Klux Klan are not going to get me. I'm going to go and leave. I'm going to go somewhere else. So I'm hoping, and what I would advocate is for people to stand back, take some time and read, identify those gaps and recognize that what we're going through is nothing new. It's just, it's become something different, but it's nothing new. But to value and place worth on whatever we do. If you're with a child who's dyslexic and they read a sentence for the first time, record it, put it on the wall, give them a gold star. And every time they do that and reward them, every time somebody says the F word, stop saying it, reward it. Because we're not, we're very good at celebrating badness because we're angry. What we're not very good at doing is shouting about the countless things that we do well, having this conversation, people tuning in. Um, the person that's been making masks during the pandemic, the, the person who, when you had half a patty or you didn't have a patty, comes at all this half a patty. So I want us to place value on the small things. There's nothing bigger than something small. That's what my friend Willard says. I want us to place value on, yes, thank you, please. I love you. To create a culture where it's okay, where you can put you put your hand on someone's shoulder and say it's okay. And if a big man cries, it's okay. If a woman says my mom's just passed, she says it's okay. If somebody picks up a book and said I've never read a book before, it says it's okay. I'll show you. Hmm. So what I'm dealing with is I would say You're talking the, about communities. Yeah, the, the word it's okay. It's okay. And with that, part B with that, and this is deadly serious, that for people like myself who are in the process of handing over, it's called generativity. I want to say to every older person over 60 or 55, psychologically, you will feel better by sharing and giving, even if you don't have something. But what you do have is memories and stories and insights and things to say to people. And young people, you have to put value. When, you're, when your friends and family say you think they failed, no, they were probably struggling at a time and they couldn't do stuff. There's something to learn. So real community is about choice. Freedom is about choice. So we need to create better choices to have more freedom. And one of the things that we can choose to do is who we talk to, who we engage with. But what I won't do is discriminate. I can learn as much from a guy in jail about resilience and how to cope in intolerable circumstances. Okay, look on the screen there. Dr. Jennifer Hawkins said, we are listening to you now, especially as old folks like me. Thank you for helping me understand the human condition a bit better. And I'm going to end with that. Dr. Glynn, I don't call you Martin. I call you Dr. Glynn because they're not handing out PhDs. I, I saw you run through walls. I saw you dig trenches to get that. And you didn't do it. You didn't do it. To have the title i know that and you know you're one of the first practitioners and academics i ever saw or witnessed bring disenfranchised young people from the hood into the corridors of academia to say look you can get your undergrad you can get a master's so i'm going to salute you and and i am from that i am from that school who says you know we need to start giving our elders our our scholars our grills, our, 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 our wives, their flowers right now, right? So I'm going to thank you for today. And I, I just want to say to the listeners, to the person that sent that comment, that all I've learned in my 63 years and coming to this point now is you have to be humble.
and the relevance of it is um i've got as much to learn from somebody with nothing as somebody with nothing has got something to learn from me with what i've got so on that basis i look forward to the next round i Definitely. look forward to this audience and i just want to thank you for the the conversation and sometimes people don't see the impact so that um, I, I was going to end with the doctor's comments because it's profound but also um a great gentleman there ivan humble ivan humble for those of you who don't know formerly was a edl regional organizer <laughs> so let's leave it with that that's why these conversations are important um once again king thank you very much people this has been safe guidance tv with dr martin glenn episode one episode two is going to come <laughs> um I, w I would argue that it's been it's very much been um one of these nights i think you know where where we can come together break bread and then reflect on what was said so listen people stay safe um, and we'll see you in episode two. Dr. Glynn, I appreciate you, King. Thank you.